our speakers. Uh, today we've got three presentations. Uh, in the book you've got them listed, two from Texas A&M, we're going to combine those. I think Dr. Clear and Dr. Herring are going to kind of tag team these. Uh, so I'll introduce them first and we'll have an update on the A&M Beatmasters as well as kind of a, a how to utilize EPDs for genetic improvement. And our two speakers are Dr. Jason Clear uh, from Texas A&M. Uh, Dr. Clear is an associate professor and Texas Agri Life Extension Bee Cattle Specialist stationed in College Station, where he develops and implements educational programs. Uh, one of those y'all might have heard of before is the Texas A&M University Beef Cattle Short Course. Uh, he's a faculty member of the Beef Cattle Section in the Department of Animal Science. He received his bachelor's degree from A&M in 1997 uh, with an emphasis, or in his master's in animal science with an emphasis in beef cattle production in 1998. He completed his doctorate in animal science with an emphasis in genetics and management at Texas Tech University in 2002. And from September of 2002 to May 2005, he served as an extension beef specialist for East Texas based in Overton. Uh, Dr. Clear has received the Vice Chancellor's Award in Excellence on two separate occasions for his performance as a member of the extension team, which developed and implemented the Texas a and Pasture and Livestock Management Workshop. As a member of the Systematic Animal Partnership, which conducted a stress physiology, physiology research. The Texas County Agricultural Agents Association has also recognized Dr. Clear as the Specialist of the Year. Dr. Clear is also a member of the American Society of Animal Science, NCBA, Texas and Southwestern Cattle Racers Association, Independent Cattlemen's Association, and he also owns a purebred operation in Madisonville, Texas. Uh, and then Dr. Andy Herring is our other presenter. Dr. Herring is a professor and the holder of the John K. Riggs Beef Cattle Professorship in the Department of Animal Science. He's also a member of the A&M Intercollegiate Faculty of Genetics. Dr. Herring was raised with cattle and sheep near Talbot, Texas, in Coleman and Reynolds counties. And the ranch has been in his family since 1886. He received his bachelor's in animal science from Tarleton State University in 1988, a master's in animal breeding from A&M in 1991, and his doctorate in genetics from Texas A&M in 1994. Uh, Dr. Herring served at Texas Tech University and then came to Texas A&M. Uh, he, teach, he has teaching and researching responsibilities within the department. He teaches undergraduate and graduate level classes in beef cattle production and management. And his research interests focus on areas of increased production efficiencies of cow-calf producers through coordination of breeding systems, environmental resources, and marketing strategies. He has researched genetic and environmental influences on milk production in beef cattle, breed differences for feedlot and carcass characteristics, and genetic influences of beef cattle reproduction on productivity, cattle temperament, and immune responses. He is active in state and national beef cattle industry groups, and Dr. Herring enjoys teaching undergraduate and graduate students and uses a wide range of techniques. He's co-trained 10 PhD students, 25 master's students and nine master's, or master's of science students and nine master's of ag students. So I'd like to welcome these two speakers and let them take it away. All right, thank you, Lance. And uh, Lance failed to mention that uh, I don't know if it's the highlight or the low light of Dr. Herring's career was that uh, I was a PhD and student under him. He was my major professor in tech. And so, uh, he, uh, it is a pleasure to get to come up here and, and uh, present with him today. And uh, and guys, we uh, we've got a little few updates for you as far as kind of where the beef center herd has come. Uh, and I'm going to spend some time kind of telling you how we've come, and then Dr. Herring's going to take over, and uh, we'll talk about kind of where we are and really uh, how we've been able to. Uh, I'll talk a little bit how we integrated it to extension programming, but he has also been heavily using it uh, from a classroom stand setting as well. So uh, with that, and if you've got questions at any time, just, just let us know. We'll be glad to try to answer those. So just a little bit as we kind of go through it.
with kind of where we, we have come from. And uh, so in the summer of, of 2018, we originally had some discussions on you know, developing a beef master as well as a red Angus herd uh, with that. And, uh, and so uh, we began those discussions with uh, Colin at the time and some other breeders. And we started putting together as a department of kind of what we were looking for as far as what would our goals be uh, for that particular program. Uh, and so in the spring of 2019, we began to refine that even more and we developed a proposal and uh, some of the specs that, that, that we felt were important with the goals of what the university wanted to do with this herd. And one of the focuses of the University or the Department of Animal Science is um, uh, looking into the future as far as focusing on cattle that will work in tropically adapted or uh, tropical type environments. Okay, and so beef master fits in extremely well. And then we also want to complement them uh, with the red angus as well. So one of the things that we wanted was the, uh, the, the females of the herd, we wanted it to be uh, red and uh, free of the spotting. Uh, we wanted maternally oriented females, but at the same time, we wanted adequate performance, muscle and growth that really meets the, the industry standards as well. Uh, confirmation that meets the standards of high quality purebred beef master cattle with a confirmation score of at least one. Uh, fairly clean underlying score as well. Uh, and again, our, our number one goal on the beef master was not necessarily just shooting for the highest carcass merit, uh, but we, we still wanted to try to begin and, and select for that as well because as we look and see where the industry is going. Uh, we also had a call for an addition to embryos, but semen donations as well. And so our goal was to build these two herds, essentially utilizing uh, embryo transfer, uh, uh, either through donated embryos, uh, strictly donated embryos, or flushes that we could do on some donor cows. Uh, however, uh, we were uh, extremely pleased when the beef master uh, breeders came to us and said, and Colin said, well, we want to do things a little bit faster and bigger on the beef master side, and uh, we want to go out and do the red angus guys. And uh, I don't he didn't really say that, but uh, I, I knew where he was coming from. But, uh, but they said, we're going to round up and we're seeking nominations for live yearling females. That way we can get the ground rolling uh, with that. And so uh, September of 2019, we actually had the first female delivered. The Emmons family delivered that female. And then if you remember, uh, two years ago, it seems like decades ago with COVID and stuff, uh, during the convention, uh, we took delivery uh, of uh, six more yearning heifers. Uh, during that convention side, that's this group right here. Uh, with that. Uh, and then again, as we move forward, uh, we had additional five females that were delivered from Collier. There was a couple more in there as well. And then uh, in May of 2020, Colin and I and, and my younger son, uh, we went on a, a COVID mission to South Texas. Uh, really, uh, Dr. Herring, I wasn't supposed to be doing this. Uh, but we were supposed to be staying at home, but we had beef master females that needed to come back to Texas a and So Colin and myself, my younger boy, we went down to South <coughs> Texas and we picked up three more additional females from three different ranches down there as well uh, with that. And so we ended up with uh, a total, I think, of 18 uh, females uh, that kind of started the, the beginning of the live animals uh, with that herd. Uh, in the fall of 2019 and spring, we did get some additional donations of embryos uh, as well as some opportunities to, to do some conventional flushes and some IVFs. Um, the neat thing about this whole program uh, of having these cattle in the purebred operation is, one, we've got things to show at a and what we're doing and also highlight what the Beastmaster breed is doing as well. But one of the neat things, and 
Dr. Herring will share this with you, uh, is the opportunity to teach our students. And so Dr. Kai Poehler is a reproductive physiologist uh, with us, and he's been on board uh, almost three years now. And Dr. Poehler uh, is, does our conventional flushing with the help of his students his graduate students, and we used to have some undergraduate students involved as well. And so they really get a lot of hands-on experience uh, outside of the classroom uh, with these animals uh, with them. Uh, the spring of 2020, we had some of the first transfers and bred the donated heifers. Uh, those donated heifers were artificially inseminated, uh, calving these bull, and then we also cleaned them up uh, with a bull that was donated by the Missy family as well, uh, a low birth weight uh, Cantonese bull too. Uh, so we had those first uh, transfers and bred them in the spring. So once you get, as you know, as breeders, as you breed cattle and, and plant the seed, you're looking forward to what's going to hit the ground. Well, and it, we did look for it in late winter and spring of 2021 and we had our first calf this one here and it was about three weeks early and I don't remember Andy how much did that thing weigh not not much uh, 35 35 pounds so we got the low birth weight deal but it was a little early <laughs> it needed to make a little longer but uh, it was born and, and, and okay uh, but then about the time we started giving others out uh, was in February, around February 14, uh, when uh, things froze over, literally. And, uh, and so we were trying to calve out cows then. This is one of the calves uh, that was born, and uh, I don't remember what those, those, they named that calf, but uh, it was born when it was near zero, and concurrently, I think the beef center was flooding it because of broken pipes. Uh, but uh, these two students here hung with that calf and, and it literally on the thermometer had a temperature that did not read. I mean, it, it probably shouldn't have been dated. But they warmed it up with these heat blankets and lamps and made it survive um, with that. So out of that, um, I don't think, no, I don't remember if we lost any calves we lost one of those original females that were donated, uh, calved, everything was okay as she slipped. We think broke her back, so we had to euthanize her. Uh, we also lost one of those heifers uh, in a freak accident about a year ago. Uh, the Beef Center was built in 1992-ish, and we've had the same water trough since then, and somehow this female got her head stuck under a bar and uh, it's literally drowning just a few inches of water there. And so, uh, you know, I kind of have to deal with that. Uh, but, uh, you know, we we're continue to move on with the program. Uh, we just we recently weaned uh, those calves, and Dr. Herring's going to talk to you a little bit about those things uh, with that. Just some of the things that we get to do with them, uh, you know, the management practices. It's all about training the students uh, and utilizing them as a tool, whether it be dehorning, whether it be deworming, taking weights, all of those things. Uh, Dr. Herring's going to talk to you a little bit about, about those kind of things. So that's kind of where we've 